today I'm on the way to Coroner's Court. I'm literally just about to leave the house. I've sort of tried to make an effort. I've got my shirt on and my jacket. A shirt dress, actually. What do you even wear to Coroner's Court? Are you supposed to dress up? Am I supposed to wear my uniform? I don't even know. Hopefully this is okay. As long as it's not casual and hoodies and things, I think I'm alright. So we'll find out when we get there. I don't think I'll be able to vlog inside. But anyway, I'll let you know how it goes when I come out and update you on my day and how amazing it's been. I am back from coroner's court. I'll do a little talk through I think from start to finish on what happened and what I experienced and all that jazz. So I got to coroner's court around 20 to 10. I was 20 minutes early for the session and there was already people there. There was the family of the deceased that were sitting and waiting to go in and a couple of other student nurses. So it was nice to have a couple of students with me and sat with me. So that was quite nice. And it, you feel so nervous. You're sat there and you feel nervous for the family that are sat there. You're thinking, oh my God, are they going to object to me being here? And it's like this really weird nervous feeling. It's the same sort of feeling like, you know, when you go through the airport security and you know that you're not guilty of anything, but you walk through and you're panicking. You're thinking, oh my God, I'm going to get stopped. I'm going to get searched. Oh my God, what if, what if this, what if that? And you don't know why, but we always feel guilty. Why do we always feel guilty? I had a similar situation. I'll tell you a funny story. Sorry, I'm going off track now. But when I was coming back from Austria, it, we had a coach trip. And on the way back, coming into England, I got stopped by the security to check for passports and things like that. And the guy just said to me, so where have you come from? Where have you just been? And I was like, what? Why are you asking me questions? Obviously I didn't say that to him. I, I was thinking this in my head and then I started panicking and my heart started going. I was like, oh my God, where have I just been? I don't even know where I've just been. Think Claire, think, think, think. And I, I literally, I said to him, oh my God, I can't, I can't think, my mind's gone blank. I've literally just come back from holiday, but I can't tell you where. <laughs> I started laughing. I was like, I'm so sorry. And um, luckily the person that I'd gone with was like, oh, we've just been to Austria. I was like, duh, we've been to Austria. Actually, no, because we stopped over in Germany on the way back. So actually, technically, we've just literally come from Germany, but then Austria before that. And then he was like, how long have you been there for? And I was like, um, seven days, I think. <laughs> and then um, and then he was like, so are we there for business, pleasure, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, what is with these questions? And it makes you feel guilty. It makes you think, oh my God, I'm guilty of something. What have I done? What have I done in Austria? Did I drop litter? Did I do this? No, I'm fine, I'm good. Just routine questions to make sure I'm not a suspect or something of that sort. But anyway, why do we always feel so nervous and guilty for things? And it's weird. Why? Why do we, if you've got the answer, tell me why. Why do we feel nervous for this? So I was sat in coroner's court. Sorry, I got sidetracked. So I was sat in coroner's court, panicking, nervous, I was sweating. Oh, I was checking my phone, I was scrolling frantically because I didn't know what to do with myself. And then um, we got called in, so then we were told that we had to sit in the back three rows, so we sat at the back. Some family sat at the front bit and then some were on the side bit. There was quite a lot of family there. And then there was a doctor there, there was a policewoman there. I was like, ooh. Um, and then again, I feel guilty. I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? And then the coroner sat there in front of you and he just explains a little bit about coroner's court and what he does. He says, so basically if someone has died from anything other than unnatural causes, um, it has to go to coroner's court so that they can decide the cause of the death basically. And they're there not to point fingers at anyone or anything like that. It's not a murder case sort of place. It's more just to work out the how, the whys, the what's, the where it happened, the time it happened. They have to confirm a lot of things, so the name of the deceased, the date of birth of the deceased, the date the person died, the, nap the medical cause of the death, the uh, hows and whys and where of the cause of death. So that's that, that was his main job, so it's sort of fitting together pieces of a jigsaw to make a complete picture and he can write his piece for the death certificate, it can all be put to rest. The coroner was really, really lovely. He was really empathetic to the family. He explained everything in layman's terms. He, he said, I'm gonna read out this post-mortem and there's a lot of medical jargon and things like that, so it's not very good. So I'm just gonna summarize it for you into a more understandable way, if that makes sense. And so he was really, really good like that. And he was very 
he was he made tried to make them comfortable and not panic and try to reassure them when they were upset and things like that he was just really good the way he handled it was lovely I uh, really appreciated him so after he's explained what his role is in coroner's court and what's going to happen he calls upon a family member just to give a brief description sort of characteristic of the deceased just to bring a little bit of I think sentimental value to it so we can get a little bit of a background of the deceased and how that person was um, before they passed and everybody's under oath so even if it even though it's coroner's court it's not like a big jury service or anything like that like people have to swear by the bible or if you're not religious you don't do the bible you just say there's that there's that phrase isn't there that's in all the movies that you watch and actually they do it in real life something like i declare that what i say is going to be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth uh, as far as my knowledge or something like that something like that um you know the spiel <laughs> But it was just weird to see it in real life being done because you don't sort of think of those things. Like you see it in films and things and just to see that really happening in real life, it's like, wow, this is so strange. It's like so surreal. And then after that, they ask, so after they spoke to the family and everything, they call in the doctor. So, or well, whatever witness is waiting. So it could be the doctor, it could be the police, it could be if there's a paramedic or someone there, if there's a nurse, any sort of person that's waiting to be a witness or to to give the evidence then they'll call those up to the, the stand so then they go up to the witness stand and they swear on the oath and then they just give their versions of events so like a timeline of what happened until that person died so it's sort of retracing the steps leading up to what's caused the death if that makes sense so they'll pick certain dates like okay so what happened on the 1st of April just talk to us about that and then they'll say okay this person coming to the doc let's just say doctor surgery I'm just saying this as um, this isn't the actual story because I don't want to go into details of the actual story because confidentiality and everything so I'm just gonna make up a story so let's just say this person visited the doctor on the 1st of April to get some form of medication or help or review or blood pressure something like that so then they'll just explain what happened on that day what services they provided to that patient any input that they think might be helpful to what the cause of the death might be that's what their role is if that makes sense i hope that makes sense and then once all of the witnesses have given their little pieces of evidence to sort of piece it all together the coroner will then go over the post-mortem and what the results were from the pathology so when someone passes away they do the post-mortem to find out the cause of the death and if there was anything else going on underlying so they'll do from head to toe assessment if there's any bruising and lacerations on the body anything abnormal or suspicious they will point that out at that point and then they'll do an internal so they'll check all the organs if there's any heart failure cancers tumors anything like that check all that and then they'll take also a urine and a blood sample from the body to check sort of medications chemical imbalances all that sort of thing so then they'll have a doctor review of that so their sort of con their own conclusion to why that patient might have died, if that makes sense, or that person might have died. But that's sort of quite a good bulk of the evidence, I think, because that's quite hardcore evidence that they go on. So then once all the evidence has been given and this timeline of events has happened, the coroner will say, OK, well, so we're going to come to the conclusion. They, they don't call it a verdict anymore. It's just a conclusion, he says. That's what he told us anyway. So then the coroner comes to a conclusion and it will be confirming the name, the date of birth, date of death, time of death, um, the place of death and then an overall conclusion on how that person has passed away. And then he says to the family, you'll get one copy of the death certificate sent to you. Um, would you like to collect it or emailed or any sort of way that you want to do, speak to us afterwards. And then he just asks if they'd like to input anything else at the end. And that's it. So what I have, I don't want to, I can't go into too much detail about what I personally witnessed today. And I, just because of confidentiality. So I just want to just think, I just want to, kind of oh, su not summarize but i want to point out a couple of things that i picked up on today in the court firstly it was really emotional it was quite an upsetting case the first one more so than the second one purely because the person that passed away had committed suicide and there was a lot of mental health problems and the family were really upset 
the um, they weren't just upset but they were angry and uh, yeah they were just it was really heartbreaking um, the family were there and it just it made me think that there's more that needs to be done for mental health patients because listening to all the evidence from the people that were there and then also from the family side of it like it was really interesting sad heartbreaking but interesting for me as a student nurse to listen to the family speak and for them to say do you know what there's not enough was done for our family member and more needs to be done and I think there is massive gaps somewhere in mental health in fact a lot of probably a lot of gaps in mental health the services that are being run at the minute they're just there needs to be more of them there needs to be so much more people to help people with mental health issues and I'm now thinking I need I feel, I feel like I need to do something I need to help people with mental health I need to create something or my mind's just it's working at 200 miles an hour and I'm just thinking what can I do what can I set up what can I think of that's going to be a massive benefit to people with mental health that's going to take the time that I can take the time out to listen to people with mental health and make a massive impact on someone's life so that it doesn't get to that point it doesn't get to that point where someone wants to end their life <sighs> I get really emotional about these things I'm so sorry but it's just it's so sad to listen and think do you know what more needs to be done for people and it's heartbreaking and if I can just think of something or do something to help someone um, to save a life oh, I just I need to do it and I don't know how something needs to be added to the services that's, that are already there and I'm going to be rattling my brains for it so overall just to summarize coroner's court it's an absolutely incredible in experience i think every student nurse um, or even every healthcare professional should get in contact with your local coroner's court and get in there and sit and observe and just see what goes on because you never know you might be called up that one day you could be that person giving evidence and it's just really insightful to go in and know what's going to happen when you're in there and to be honest it does put even though I was nervous at the start and it was a bit emotional but it does put your mind at ease so now I think if something was to happen in, in a ward or something I had to go and give evidence I'm going to be okay with it yeah I'll be a little bit nerve-wracking but because I've seen it and I've witnessed what happens now you've got that little bit more knowledge about what goes on and you're not under trial or anything like that so nothing scary i think everyone should experience it and just prepare themselves for if what if that was to happen and what if you were to take stand it's really really good for your knowledge and i've learned so much today it's really made me think as you can see and yeah so if you haven't got any plans to go to coroner's court please look into it go and book in find out where your local one is and email somebody get down there get have have a look I'll put some links below about coroner's court and what to expect and things. I'm going to have a look and search for you. So I'll put all the links below and hopefully that gives you a bit of insight to what coroner's is and hopefully you're going to go book it and I'll see you all next time.